Welcome! In this video, we'll be implementing the natural numbers, along with basic arithmetic operations for them and comparison. Along the way, we'll see our first inductive data type in Haskell, which I'm about to define now. So in order to implement the natural numbers, we define the following data type, which is called nat, and its definition looks as follows. So an object of type nat can be constructed either using the constructor z, which stands for zero, or it can be a successor of an existing natural number. And the successor constructor is just uh, abbreviated with s. Okay, so that concludes the definition for nat. And I'm going to derive uh, show and ek so that we have equality on this new data type and that we can also print it to the console. Now, at first glance, this definition might seem a bit mysterious, so let me explain exactly what's going on. The idea is that a natural number is basically a thing that can be obtained by counting. So you start at zero, and then you start counting, so you count zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, and anything you can obtain uh, through a sequence of counting is a natural number. This idea of counting from one number to the next is captured by this successor function. So basically we start with uh, zero, so zero is a natural number, and then we apply iteratively the successor function to existing natural numbers to get ones that are like one step bigger. So another way to think about the successor function is that you're adding one to a number. And now because the only way we can construct a natural number is either by zero or by successors to pre-existing natural numbers, we're basically saying that natural numbers are all the things you can get by counting when you start at zero. Perhaps this will become clearer if I show you some examples. So I'm going to run ghci and load the script, which is called induction nat. And now let's construct some natural numbers. So as I said before, z is a natural number. So I can just type z, that's just the, the constructor for uh, zero. If I check the type of z, I see it's an object of type nat. Or I could uh, apply the successor function to an existing natural number. For instance, I can apply the successor function to z. That also gives me a natural number. And I can just keep going like this. So I could apply the successor to, let's say, the, the successor of z. And that again gives me a natural number, the successor of the successor of z, and so on. So the way to interpret uh, these things here as uh, like the usual natural numbers, well, z is 0, and then s of z would be 1, and then s of s of z would be 2, and then you just keep on going like that. So basically, the number of s's in the, the data type determines the, the magnitude of the number. To make this idea precise that I just explained with counting the number of s's to convert from an object of type nat to like a usual number, we can uh, write a function called from nat. And this will be a conversion function from an object of type nat to like a usual number, in this case, an integer. So uh, by doing this, we'll only get non-negative integers, but it's still a function going from nat to int. Now, because our data type nat has two possible constructors, we need to say what our function does in either case. So uh, definitions of functions out of nat will always have the same form. They'll look as follows. So we need to first say what from nat does to the first constructor, which is 0. And then in the second step, we need to say what from nat does if we applied the successor in the last step. So we need to say what happens to from nat s of n, where n is a pre-existing natural number. Now, once we make both of these definitions, we've covered all cases because a natural number is either of the form z or it's of the form s of some existing natural number. So if you want, you can now think about how you would fill in these two slots here in the definition on your own in order to convert a uh, object of type nat into an integer. So the basic idea is just to count the number of s's that occurs in the natural number. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So first we need to define what uh, we convert z to. And we already said that we think of z as 0. So from that, of z should be just 0. Now the more complicated case is the second case here, 
what should from that do to the successor of n? Well, here we may assume that we already know what from that does to n itself, because n is a strictly less complex object than the successor of n. So I can say that, okay, I know what from that uh, of n is, and now I want to, from this value, get what from that of the successor of n should be. And well, if I add this additional s here, I should increment the number I obtain by 1. So taking successors is like adding 1. So here the proper definition is that this should be from that of n plus 1. Now the way to read this is bracketed in the following manner. So we're first evaluating from that of n, and then we're adding 1. But in fact, because function evaluation binds so strongly, these brackets here are redundant, so I'm again going to remove them. Okay, let's take this uh, function for a spin. So we reload the script, and let's test out from that of z, that indeed gives 0. And what does from that do if we, let's say, apply it to s of s of s of z? Like this, we have three s's, so this should return the number 3. And indeed, this makes sense because basically this function is just adding 1 for every s that occurs in, in our natural number, and eventually, uh, we strip all of the s's out and reach z, in which case we have a value of 0. So uh, adding plus 1 uh, as many times as we have s's uh, yields the, the corresponding uh, number. All right, let's continue by going in the other direction. So we're going to write a function called 2nat, which converts a, a non-negative integer into a natural number. So here we don't have a data type in Haskell that uh, represents non-negative integers, so we're going to define this function on integers, but we're going to raise an error if the uh, value we input it is negative. Now if you want, you can try to implement this function on your own. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So we're going to, well, define what 2nat does on integers. So the first uh, possibility, which is kind of the obvious case, is when uh, the number is 0. So we know what 0 should correspond to. It should correspond to uh, the natural number z. And then the second case would be when the number is not 0. So here I'm just going to say that uh, I have some integer n, and I now want to convert it to a natural number. So here there are basically two cases, which I'm going to distinguish with uh, guards. So in the reasonable case where this uh, number n is strictly positive, so we've covered the case 0 here, so, uh, well, if it's a non-negative number, then in the second case we should be strictly positive. So in this reasonable case, uh, this is where, like, the meat of the definition is going to lie. And then there's a second case which is unreasonable, which is if, uh, well, the number is, is negative. So in the case where um, n is negative, uh, we return an error. And we're going to say that uh, error, I don't know, number uh, is negative. Okay. Um, but so the case we now need to concern ourselves with is this, this case here where n is strictly positive. And, well, the idea is that if I uh, am in this case, I can assume that I know what the function does on all numbers that are strictly less than n here. Because if I always like reduce n by 1, I eventually hit 0. And for 0, I know what the function does. So the way to do this definition recursively is as follows. So I take the successor of whatever 2 nat of n minus 1 produces. So 2 nat of n minus 1 gives me the natural number corresponding to n minus 1. And then if I take the successor of that, well, that should be the natural number corresponding to n. So this definition here somehow inverts uh, this definition up here. So taking successors in the natural numbers is like adding 1 in the integers. And here it's reversed. So here we're taking the successor of the natural number corresponding to n minus 1. Okay, doke. So let's save that and uh, see whether it works. So I'm now going to try uh, 2 nat, let's say, of well, 0. Uh, that should give 0. That's correct. Let's try 2 nat of 5, and you see here I get a natural number which has uh, 5 s's uh, preceding the 0. So this is exactly uh, what this function does. It basically just adds 
the number uh, of s's uh, to 0 that you, you give it. OK, so I hope that these uh, conversion uh, functions here have given you some intuition on why this data type actually does represent natural numbers. Well, we're now going to move on to defining uh, arithmetic functions on, on the, these objects. So the natural arithmetic operations that we have on the natural numbers are addition, then we have multiplication, and finally we have exponentiation. Now all of these functions take two arguments, which are both natural numbers, and they should again return a natural number. And the pattern for defining these three functions is always going to be the same. We again use recursion, and this is very natural because the natural numbers are defined inductively. So um, recursive definitions pair very well with inductive uh, data types. So the first function we're going to implement is addition, which here I'll call plus. So it'll be a function going from that to that to that like this. So it takes two natural numbers and returns a third. Now the pattern that we're going to use to define this function recursively is the following. So I'm going to first say what plus does if I add any natural number n to, to 0. And in the second step, I'm going to say what happens if I add n to the successor of some natural number m. Now the reason this is a good pattern that covers all cases is because, well, here I'm basically reducing the complexity of the second argument by one step. And if I do this uh, often enough, I'll eventually reach this case here where I hit 0. And so I'll always land in the base case. Uh, notice, however, that in the first argument, I'm not doing anything. So somehow the complexity of the first argument stays the same, but I only reduce like the complexity of the second argument. OK, so if you want, you can now take some time to think about how you would uh, write the definition in both of these cases. I'll now proceed to the solution. So in the first case, we want to say what addition should do if we add some natural number n to 0. Well, n plus 0 for any natural number n should just be n itself. OK, so this base case is uh, pretty simple if you know what addition should do. Now for the second case, we need to uh, use recursion. So here we need to think about what n plus the successor of m should be. And here it might be helpful to sort of uh, off to the side do a quick calculation. So if I add n plus the successor of a number, so remember that the successor is like that number plus 1. So if I'm adding n plus m plus 1, well, that's the same thing as if I just add n plus m and then add 1 to the result. So this is just like associativity of addition. So I'm like rebracketing this expression to move the brackets here from the right over to the left. Now, why is this useful? Well, if you notice here, I'm adding n plus m plus 1, whereas here on the right hand side, I'm just adding n to m. So this addition that's happening here is somehow less complex than the addition happening here because the second argument to the addition here is m, while here it's m plus 1. So I can use this equality here to define um, addition recursively. So essentially what this is saying is that if I want to add n plus m plus 1, what I do is I add n plus m and then add 1 to the result. Now, this equality here is somehow happening in the integer world. So we now want to move this over to uh, the natural number world that we're working in, so to our data type. So remember that adding plus 1 is just uh, corresponds to taking successors. So in order to get, um, well, n plus the successor of m, uh, the result should be the successor of, well, n plus m. So I can write it like this. OK, so let's uh, save, reload, and make sure that this function works as intended. So I'm going to um, add two numbers. And because I don't want to type out all of the, the s's, I'm just going to use 2nat to convert some integers to natural numbers. So if I add, let's say, 2nat3 to 2nat4, this should give 7, right? So if I uh, press enter here, I see I get an expression. And if I count the number of s's occurring in it, I see it, it's, it's indeed 7. If I wanted to uh, not have to count all of this, I could um, 
basically uh, use the from that function we had previously and calculate from that of whatever the result I get here is, and I see that indeed it's 7. Okay, so let's move on to the remaining two operations, which are multiplication and taking uh, powers. So multiplication, again, has the same type signature, so it takes two natural numbers and returns a third. And we're again going to use exactly the same pattern as we did for addition. So I'm going to write mult nz. I need to define the value here. And then also I need to define what happens if I multiply n with the successor of some natural number m. And exactly the same pattern also works for taking powers. So here um, I'm raising the first argument to the second. So I have two arguments which are natural numbers and then I return a natural number. And I'm going to say first what happens if I raise a natural number to the power of zero. So that I need to define. And finally, I need to also say what happens if I raise a natural number n uh, to the power, the successor of m, like this. So here I'll again give you some time to think about how you would fill in these definitions in order to make these functions do what they should. My uh, hint is to use the same idea as I sketched up here. So you should write out um, sort of these operations in this case where we need to use recursion in terms of like usual uh, mathematical notation and see how you can manipulate the expression on the left into something that is somehow less uh, complex as I did here and then use that idea to define the function recursively. Okay, I'll now move on to presenting the solutions for both of these functions. So in the first case, uh, we need to first define what multiplication does on the base case where we multiply n by zero. Well, this case is easy because n times zero should just be zero. Now the second case here is where we need to uh, put in some thought. So I'll again uh, do this sort of calculation. So I'm multiplying n by the successor of m. So that's m plus one. And now I can use distributivity um, on this equation to get that this should be equal to n times m, like this, uh, plus n, right? And here the bracketing uh, is like this. Now the reason this is, again, a good uh, thing to do is because here I'm multiplying n by m plus 1, whereas here the multiplication operation is just happening between n and m. And so the second argument here is strictly less complex than uh, over here in this multiplication. So I can use this right-hand side to recursively define what uh, this thing should be. And notice here I'm just using addition. And addition is something I've uh, just previously defined up there. Okay, so now let's convert this into uh, code that actually works on our data type for the natural numbers. So I'm basically just going to transcribe uh, this thing here. So here I need to multiply n by m. So that's uh, going to be mult n m. And then I need to add uh, n to the result. And here I already have a function which does that called plus. And I'm going to use uh, the infix notation here. So I'm going to write plus n like this. Okay, and the way this should be read is uh, bracketed as follows. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that like that. So let's uh, save and uh, reload to see. Oh, whoops, the uh, power function isn't defined yet. So uh, let me just for the moment comment out uh, the power function here so that I can uh, actually compile the script. Okay, so I'm uh, reloaded and now I can check whether molt works as expected. So let's multiply uh, two nat of two. So that's the natural number corresponding to two with two nat of three and the result should be six. And indeed I see here I get a number which has uh, six S's so that's correct. Okay, now let's move on to defining the, the power function. So here in the base case, I need to say what happens if I raise n to the power zero. So in that case, we should uh, get one. So I can express one as s of z. And now for uh, the second case, we again need to think about what the recursion should be doing. So this is basically n raised to the power um, m plus one like this. 
And again, using laws for arithmetic, um, this is the same as if I have n to the power m, but I now multiply this entire result uh, by n again. And this should be bracketed like that. And, uh, again, the situation is the same as for the other cases here. I'm raising n to the power m plus 1, but here in this uh, right-hand side of the equation, I only have uh, n to the power m, which is a less complex expression. Uh, however, I'm using multiplication, but that's fine since I already have defined multiplication uh, up, up there. Okay, so let's uh, write down the right-hand side of this equality uh, for the function definition. So here I want to say that this should be, uh, well, n raised to the mth power, so that's pow n m. And again, I'll use the infix notation for the multiplication. So I'm multiplying this entire thing uh, by, by n. And here again, the bracketing should be read like this, even though these brackets, as I put them, are redundant. Okay, so let's uh, save and reload. Let's see what uh, 2 to the power 3 is. So that should be 8. And if we uh, see here, this is indeed uh, 8 s's. So that uh, produces the right result. We now move on to the next thing we'll see for this video, which is the comparison operators. So uh, natural numbers have a order structure on them, which basically is given by like how many successors you take. So a number is greater or equal to another number if it contains more applications of the successor function. To give an example of this, let's say we want to compare uh, the successor of the successor of the successor of 0 um, to just the successor of the successor of 0. And now I want to find out which number is bigger. And well, the bigger number is the one that has more applications of, of s here. Now, the, the, the problem is that if I don't yet know like what natural numbers are, I can't just say, well, I need to count the number of s's here and count the number of s's here and, well, take the, the bigger one, because that would sort of be cyclical. So we need to somehow find a way to determine which of these numbers has more s's without referring to like the number of s's. Now, what you can notice is that one way to do this is just to iteratively delete s's from both sides until you reach zero on either one of the sides. So I can determine which one has more s's by kind of just removing s's one by one. So in the first step, I remove one s here and one s here. And then I see that, well, both numbers are still not zero. And then I continue, so I remove one s here and I remove one s here. And now I see that the right-hand number has reached zero, whereas the left-hand one has not. And so the original numbers, so the original right-hand number was strictly smaller than the one on the left. On the other hand, if uh, the situation was reversed, so let's say the left-hand number has less s's than the right-hand number, and I uh, apply this uh, procedure, then I would just remove one s like so, and I would hit zero here on the left, which means that the left-hand number was originally strictly smaller than the right-hand number. Okay, so let's uh, apply this idea to define the less than equals operator, which will be an operator that takes two natural numbers and compares them. So it should uh, return a Boolean value, um, and it should return true if the left-hand side is less than or equal than the right-hand side. So as I explained before, the recursion will work as follows. So if neither of the two numbers are zero, uh, then they'll have the form successor of n and successor of m. And in this case, we just remove the s's from both sides and, well, compare the, the remaining uh, numbers. So the recursion will be uh, like this. So we say that the successor of n is less than or equal to the successor of m if n is less than or equal to m. So we're just stripping the s's from both sides. Now, this pattern here is different from the recursive pattern we had for defining the arithmetic operations because we're reducing both numbers at the same time. So here we had kind of the first argument always fixed, but here we're kind of reducing the complexity on both arguments at the same time. And therefore, the base cases that we can reach are going to be different. So I'll let you think about for yourself for a moment what the 
right base cases are that we need to define this function on in order for the recursion to always reach one of the base cases. And you should also think about what the corresponding uh, Boolean value should be on those uh, cases. So there will be two cases is my hint. And uh, I'll now proceed to uh, showing you what they are. So the first base case will be if we hit 0 uh, in the first argument. So um, well, if, if this number here contains uh, at most as many um, s's as this number here, well, then we'll reach 0 um, on the left uh, first. Uh, on the right, we might also have 0, but it could also be like the successor of some something. So here I'll just put a blank because it doesn't matter. If we reach 0 on the left, then we know that the original number on the left-hand side was less than or equal to the, the right-hand number, so the value here should be true. On the other hand, it's also possible that we would reach 0 on the right, so we could have uh, this situation occurring. And well, in this case, we know that we aren't in this first case. So we know that uh, the left hand side is not 0. And therefore, we have a 0 on the right, but not a 0 on the left. Uh, so in this case, actually, the left hand side is not less than or equal to the right hand side. So uh, in this case, we should return false. So if you want, you could have also written s of blank here, because we know that if we aren't in this first case, we are in fact uh, in this case where the left-hand side is still a successor of something. And maybe this is a bit clearer for uh, understanding why this should be false, because if we have a successor of any number, this will never be less than or equal to 0. So now that we've saved the script and reload it, let's test out this uh, function. So let's say what the uh, lec of 2 nat 5 and 2 nat uh, 6, that should be true. Okay, it's indeed true. If I have the same number, so if compare 5 with 5, that's still true. But if I have uh, 5 and 4, I get false. And again, the reason for this is I'm just stripping successors from each side of these numbers until I hit 0 on one side, and that will determine uh, whether it's less than or equal or not based on these definitions here. Okay. So now uh, we can implement the remaining comparison operators based on less than or equal. So I'm going to first uh, write a function which gives me greater than or equal. So this is, uh, has the same type signature as uh, less than or equal. So it takes two natural numbers and returns a Boolean. And you can think for yourself how you would define this. So I mean, either you could give the direct definition that's analogous to this definition up here, but a better way to do it is just to use less than or equal directly in the definition of greater than equal. So think about how you would define uh, greater than equal and m in terms of the less than equal function. I'll uh, now give you the solution. So n is greater or equal to m. Well, precisely when m is less than or equal to n. So it's just like uh, switching the order of the arguments. Finally, we can also define uh, strict inequalities, which I'll call LT for less than. So again, this is uh, something that takes two natural numbers and produces a Boolean. And uh, analogously, we can uh, well define greater than, which should be strict uh, as well. So this again takes two natural numbers and produces a Boolean. Now less than can again be defined using the previous uh, functions we have. So maybe think about that for a moment. So the uh, key to defining less than is noticing that, well, one number is strictly less than another number if it's not the case that the other one is greater or equal than the, the first number. So less than of nm should be equal to not, well, greater uh, than or equals um, nm, like this. And uh, here I need to bracket things like that in order for it to work out. And finally, uh, greater than I could define using either, uh, well, less than, or I could also use less than or equals in an analogous definition to this. Uh, let's do the following. Let's say n is strictly greater than m. Well, if 
uh, m is strictly less than m, like this. Okay, to make sure that we uh, did all of this right, let's uh, do some examples. So let's first test uh, greater or equals than, so 2 nat 5, uh, 2 nat 5, that should be true. So every number should be greater or equal than themselves. Um, if we have compare 5 with 4, that should be true, right? 5 is greater or equal than 4. On the other hand, let's say 3 uh, is not greater or equal than 4. It is, however, uh, strictly less than, so this should return uh, true. However, if we compare a number with itself, so compare uh, 3 with 3, that should not be strictly less than, so that's indeed the case. And well, greater than uh, will work similarly. In the final part of the video, I'm going to introduce you to a functional pattern called folding. And in the case of natural numbers, this pattern is particularly simple. So we're going to fold over uh, natural numbers. More generally, we can fold over basically any inductively defined data type in Haskell. And folding is particularly useful for things like lists, uh, where this pattern kind of captures a lot of different uh, operations that you could, in principle, write functions for using just usual recursion. But uh, the fold pattern somehow makes uh, things a lot more compact. In the case of natural numbers, folding over a natural number will just basically be repeatedly applying a given operation, um, well, as many times as the size of that natural number. Okay, so I'll now define what uh, folding over natural numbers does. So it's going to be a function called fold n. It'll have the following type signature. So it's going to take a function going from a to a. Uh, so we think of that as the operation that's being applied iteratively. Then it's also going to take a starting value of type a. And uh, next, it'll also take a natural number. That's the natural number we're folding over. And the result of this entire thing will be uh, another uh, value of type a, which is basically the value we obtain when we apply this operation here n times to the starting value. Okay, so the definition for folding will be as follows. So I first need to say what uh, fold n does on a specific operation, let's call it h, uh, some starting value, which I'll call c, and uh, zero. So that's uh, sort of the base case because, uh, well, this natural number could either be zero or it could be a successor of a previous one. Uh, what does it do on the case where we uh, just are folding over zero? Well, in this case, that's like applying h zero times to the starting value. So that should just uh, return the starting value c. In the more uh, complicated case where I'm uh, applying this to a successor of some natural number n like this, what should it do? Well, in that case, I want to apply this operation h one more time to the value I obtain if I fold over n with h and starting value c. So the definition will be h of, and then I uh, put in brackets, uh, fold uh, n of h c uh, n, like this. Okay, so now because this pattern is sort of abstract, it's maybe uh, not entirely clear what it's doing. So the intuition is that if I like fold um, n, I fold h over a starting value c, like let's say uh, capital N times like this. Uh, well, what should this be? Well, it should be like applying H capital N times to the starting value. So I'm like applying H uh, and so on. And eventually I have like uh, H of C like this. And the number of H's that I'm applying, like the number of times I'm applying this operation is exactly this natural number capital N that I'm folding over. So folding over natural numbers is just like iteratively applying an operation to a starting value and the number of times that you apply the operation for is exactly the natural number you're folding over. Okay, so let's save and uh, reload to give you an example of this. So let's fold the following operation, namely uh, I'm going to uh, have this operation here where I'm going to append the symbol exclamation mark um, to a list and my starting value is going to be 
the, the empty list like this. And now I'm going to fold over some natural number. So let's start with z. So what happens if I fold this operation here uh, over the empty list uh, over the natural number z? So in that case, I'm not going to uh, get anything. So I'm just going to return the starting value because I'm just applying this operation zero times. So that's just uh, going to return the starting value of the empty list, which in this case is expressed as an empty string because uh, this thing here is going to uh, append like characters. So the return value will be a string. On the other hand, if I uh, do a non-trivial fold, so I fold the same uh, starting value over uh, some actual like natural number, let's like to nat five, so that's the natural number five. So then I get a string containing five exclamation marks. And the reason for this is because I'm applying this operation here five times to the empty list, and that produces a string uh, will with five exclamation marks in it. So I'm just repeating this operation uh, this many times, uh, starting with this value here. In a similar fashion, you could uh, think about other folds. So let's say I want to it iteratively add two to let's say the number four, and I want to do this five times, then I get 14. Why is this? Well, if I add uh, two five times, that gives me like plus 10. And if I start with a value of four, well then four plus 10 is 14. Now, if we go back to the definitions we gave here of uh, the arithmetic operations on the natural numbers, we can observe that basically all of these involve like an iterated application of a certain operation. So uh, addition here is like iterated adding of plus one to uh, some number. So uh, another way to think about it is to iteratively apply the successor function. So to see this, let's uh, think about what n plus m is. Well, I can write n plus m as the following uh, addition. So I can write n plus one, uh, plus like one, plus and so on, plus one, where here I am add one m times, right? So I can think of addition of uh, the number m as just repeated addition of one m times. And in a similar manner here for multiplication, if I uh, do n times m, I can think of this as iterated addition of um, n to, to some uh, starting value. Concretely, I can think of this as being, well, zero uh, plus n plus and so on. So I'm just always adding n to zero and I'm adding n m times to zero. And finally, the same goes for exponentiation here. So I can think about raising n to the mth power, right? This is just like starting with one and then multiplying one by n and I continue multiplying uh, by n until I do so m times. So here I'm repeatedly multiplying uh, n to one m times. So if you uh, look at these these cases, they are all they are all uh, fall into this folding pattern. So here the starting value is n, and then the operation is adding one, and I'm folding over the second number here, right? So I'm doing this m times. Uh, similarly, here the starting value is zero, and I'm the the operation I'm doing is plus uh, n, and I'm doing so m times. So that's just the the size of the the second number. So I'm, I'm folding over the second number and the operation I'm folding is plus n with starting value zero. And finally, for the taking powers here, uh, it's the same pattern. I start with a value of one. I perform an operation, namely multiplication by n, and I do so m times. So it's like folding over the second argument. So with those ideas, um, we're now going to re-implement um, the arithmetic functions we had uh, previously using folds. So I'll let you uh, think about that on your own for a moment. So how can you use this folding pattern to re-implement uh, arithmetic operations? So because this is sort of an abstract uh, pattern, you might have some trouble here. So don't worry if you don't uh, think of it immediately. I'm now going to continue to the solution. So I'm going to define a function called plus prime, which takes two natural numbers like this and returns a third. And well, what should plus prime do on n and m? 
So here I now don't even have to split into cases because I can directly use the folding pattern to define it. Okay, so using the idea from before, um, adding m to n is like, uh, well, iteratively applying the successor function to the number n, and I apply the successor function m times. So it's like applying an operation, namely the successor function, to the number n, and I'm doing so m times. Okay, so this uh, compact definition here basically just expresses that I'm iteratively applying successors to n, and how much am I doing that? I'm doing it m times. So let's uh, save this and reload to make sure it works. So uh, let me do plus prime of uh, 2 nat 5 and uh, 2 nat 3. This should be 8. So let's check. So this is 3. And then here I have uh, five more. So that seems to have worked. Now, because of partial function evaluation here in principle, this argument m here is redundant. So I could also kind of get rid of the m on both sides. And in fact, I could even get rid of the n on both sides because whenever you have like, uh, yeah, the same arguments occurring on both sides, you can just instead of like saying what the function does on on all arguments, you can just define one function in terms of another. So an even more compact way of defining addition is just saying that it's it's fold n of s, and well, what does it do on arguments n and m? Well, you just apply uh, arguments n and m to both sides, and well, that tells you how to evaluate it on arguments. Oh, here I uh, got rid of the, the prime accidentally. Okay, let's uh, do the same thing for multiplication. So multiplication will be something that again takes two natural numbers and returns a third. Now mult prime of nm should be the following. So I'm again gonna use folds. Now what's the operation that I'm going to, well, be applying iteratively? Well, it's going to be addition of the number n. So I can capture this uh, using, uh, well, partial function evaluation and infix. Uh, notation. So it's going to be, the operation is basically plus n, right? And the starting value I'm going to start at, in this case, is going to be 0. So I'm going to add uh, n, m times to 0, like this, and that's going to be what the uh, multiplication of n by m is. Now again, because m is occurring on both sides of the definition, I could, in principle, get rid of both of these m's. Finally, let's do uh, the power function. So I'm going to define power prime. So this will take, again, two natural numbers and return a third. Now, power prime of nm. So this is going to be like iterated multiplication starting at 1. So it's going to be fold n, where I now uh, apply uh, mult uh, n several times. And I uh, am going to start at uh, 1 in this case. So I need to have a starting value of s of z and I'm going to do this m times. Now here I'm noticing that I used uh, just plus and mult, so those were like the original definitions. So instead we could also define this using just plus prime and mult prime, and that would also be fine. Okay, so let's uh, save and reload to make sure that uh, multiplication and taking powers uh, works correctly. So here mult prime of two nat, let's say three, uh, 2 nat uh, 4, so that should be 12. So that's quite a lot of s's, so let's uh, use our from nat function here to convert this into um, just a usual uh, integer, so we see that it indeed gives 12. And let's see what the powers are, so uh, let's raise 3 to, I don't know, the third power, and that gives 27, which is correct. Now I'm also noticing that really we didn't uh, really aren't really using this infix uh, notation here because well plus prime n here this is a, a reasonable partial uh, function uh, application so uh, this also does the same thing as just adding n maybe the infix kind of uh, conveys the the idea that we're doing like something like plus n uh, in, in like a better way but uh, I think I'll just remove that. Uh, infix notation there to make it look slightly nicer. 
Okay, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. So we've uh, seen how to define natural numbers inductively in Haskell. And then we saw how we can use this inductive data type to define the usual arithmetic operations, as well as comparison between natural numbers. And finally, I introduced this idea of folding over a natural number, which is basically just iteratively applying a certain operation to a starting value. And using this uh, functional pattern, we can uh, very compactly uh, implement addition, multiplication, and taking powers. So here, if you want it to be even more compact, I could get rid of all of the redundant arguments. And uh, you see that these definitions are uh, much more compact than what we had above. On the other hand, uh, this somehow introduces uh, an additional layer of abstraction. And if you like read this definition here and didn't know what uh, the folding was doing exactly, um, it might be much more difficult to understand than uh, this definition up here, which is more explicitly telling you what addition actually does on each of the cases. Maybe as a final note, um, I'll like uh, tell you that folding is somehow like looping in imperative languages. So in something like uh, Python, you might write something like, you know, I don't know, I have some, uh, I don't know, val equals C. So I set a starting value. Um, and then I have like a for loop. So I say something like for i um, in range, uh, let's say, uh, in this case, uh, m, if I'm folding over the number m, uh, do the following. So what am I, am I doing? So I'm applying the operation to my starting value each time I go through the loop. So this would be something like val equals h of uh, val, okay? And now if you think about what's happening here, so first I set a starting value for uh, my value. So that's what uh, this uh, starting value C is in the fold. And then I, well, I'm folding over this natural number M here. So that's like a for loop where I'm going uh, through the loop M times. And then each time in the loop, I'm, well, updating my value by applying the operation H from the fold to the value. So this would be like uh, folds uh, are, are somehow like, like loops in, in imperative languages. And so somehow we capture this pattern uh, in, a, in a single function. And in that case, you can express uh, things like these arithmetic operations or other, other operations very succinctly by saying that it's like applying this pattern to a certain starting value with a certain operation.